Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you on this. This is my first Google Hangout. Uh, it's hard to know who's out there listening. It looks like we've got a few people. Jacob Horniker, uh, Darby Callahan, a couple of others. Jacob is a seminarian. I know him. Uh, so... Uh, Thought we'd begin with a prayer. <laughs> Gene's over there telling me. Gene Stoppel said, I have people in the studio here who are helping me out. So uh, we're going to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this night and this opportunity to uh, be together in this virtual way. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon all who are watching and uh, also to use these uh, videos and other things for the advancement of your kingdom. Mother Mary, we ask your intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Uh, it says here I have seven viewers. I can make sure the volume is all the way. Well, that's just my volume. I don't know if that's going to affect me. Microphone. Anyway, my volume is now all the way up. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just begin with a few comments. Uh, a couple days ago, somebody sent me an email and said, what's the most important thing for young adults to know today? And I responded. So I'm going to share with you what I responded. And I, basically I said, uh, that's Lionel. He just went through the background. He's my tech guy here. <laughs> um, do I need that microphone? No. I can tell that I can tell that the auto is working here because it's picking me up. Okay. And and uh, people have been submitting questions saying they can hear me. Yep. So um, the question or the issue was, you know, what should be said to young adults today? And I would say the main thing is that we are in a we're in a critical position today for the evangelization of our young adults. And the reason is because most young adults today don't believe in God and certainly don't believe in the Catholic Church. And so uh, those who do, who have that privileged gift of faith and the privileged gift of loving his church, they have to be extra strong today if they're gonna be able to share their faith with other young adults. What that means is that they have to be well-formed and this formation has to be both intellectual and spiritual. So intellectual, I have to know my faith. I have to know the philosophical underpinnings of my faith. The questions like, what is a human person? And, and what is love? And these sorts of things that will help to speak today to people about our faith. But I also have to have a very strong prayer life so that I can become a person who's docile to the Holy Spirit and can be easily led by the Holy Spirit so that I can be used by the Holy Spirit to evangelize uh, other young adults. I would say especially the whole question of love is a huge question for young adults today, and there's a lot of confusion about what real love is. And the best way to clear up that confusion is to read the book Love and Responsibility by Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II. It's the best book on love that there is. But if you find that a little too heavy, some people do. Uh, a guy named Edward Shree, S-R-I, has written a great book uh, just about called Men and Women um, and Love, I think it's called. And uh, it's kind of a summary of John Paul II's love and responsibility. And the final point I would make for young adults today is, is really a pope that Pope Francis has been making about the importance of accompaniment. So if we're going to help young adults in our culture come to know uh, Jesus and his church, and they're a long ways from that. Their understanding of what a human person is, their understanding of life is a long ways from that. Then we have to be willing to spend a lot of time accompanying them on that long journey from where they are to the Catholic Church. And that means being ready to listen to them and walk with them in the struggles, and which has been a big emphasis of Pope Francis as he encourages us to go out to the peripheries and try to bring with us the love of Christ and bring people back to the love of Christ. Okay, so that was my little introduction. And uh, 
now I'm going to um, answer a few questions. So I got uh, five questions on my right. And the first one I'm going to answer is on the top here. Can young men or women date while discerning the priesthood or the sisterhood? Uh, that's a good question. Generally, the answer is no, that they shouldn't be dating while they're discerning the priesthood or the sisterhood. I clicked on that. My tech tech guy. Well, that was that was that's the next question. So I wanted to go back to that other one. Um, so <laughs> I was working on the other one. Is it possible to go back or no? Probably not. Thank you. So um, the answer is generally no. Young men and women shouldn't date while while they're actively discerning the priesthood and/or the sisterhood. And the reason is because when you're discerning the priesthood or the sisterhood, you're basically discerning an exclusive relationship with Jesus Christ, and and giving your life completely to Him. So it'd be a little bit like dating two people or at the same time, which which you know most of the time the one one or more of those persons doesn't really appreciate that, <laughs> and it helps. It's harder to discern: should I live exclusively to this person? Um, or with this person, if I'm dating both of them at the same time. And also you have the disadvantage of that whatever person you're dating, they're they're pretty concrete. You know, you can talk to them, you can spend time with them, you can hold their hand. Um, but it's hard to do that with Jesus and his church. <laughs> and so it can get in the way. The distraction there can be a kind of distraction there of it's more attractive to go with the concrete than it is with the the uh, less concrete discernment that happens when you're discerning your vocation. Now that being said, so generally the rule is no. If you're if you're actively discerning your a vocation to the consecrated life or the priesthood, you shouldn't be dating. Certainly, if you're in seminary, you shouldn't be dating. But um, if there can be a time where you're actively discerning for some time, and then as part of that discernment, it can make sense to date. But you should really only do that with good counsel. So that's how I would answer. The next question, what advice would you give to young adults in discernment to the priesthood? Pray. That would be my main advice. Uh, pray a lot because uh, it reminds me actually of the story. And I, I have something I can show you. Hold on right here. So if you look at this photo right here, this is Pope Francis. And he's talking to me. And uh, can you see, yeah, you can see that pretty well, can't you? Good. Anyway, when I met Pope Francis in this particular occasion, uh, he he put his finger right in my chest. This you can't see it really in this photo. I probably have one over there, but that takes too long to find it. And he said to me, "Pray a lot, pray a lot," and he said it three times. And uh, I think that's the best advice for someone who's discerning. Why? Because discernment is fundamentally a question of the heart. It's a question of is God calling me to give my heart completely to him? And therefore, if I'm going to discern, I have to be uh, ready to open my heart completely to God. And I have to be ready to listen with my heart to see what God wants. And so that is fundamentally going to happen in prayer. Uh, the second thing I need to do is uh, go to daily mass because that close connection with Jesus in the Eucharist is really essential for good discernment. And also what I need to do is uh, to get some good spiritual direction. So to meet with someone, maybe a priest or a religious, who could help me uh, in my discernment, who could I could talk to about my questions and my fears, because uh, it's really important to have good guides when one's going through discernment. The, uh, uh, yeah, I think, so I think those would be the main things, advice that I would give. Pray a lot. Every day, spend some time in silent prayer. Second, um, talk to, uh, get, get some help in your discernment. Third, go to daily mass. Uh, if you're actively discerning, those are going to be very, very helpful. That one's done. Next question. Uh, can lay people serve as Eucharistic ministers in the church? Well, uh, the answer is lay people can serve as extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. 
which is a different thing, technically speaking, than a Eucharistic minister. So the only, quote, Eucharistic ministers in the church are those who are ordained. So deacons or priests um, or bishops. But the... Uh, Though, but lay people can serve as extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. That is, they can be appointed either on a temporary or even a permanent basis to be distributors of Holy Communion. But we keep that word extraordinary in there just to show that the ordinary minister is an ordained person. There is the uh, unusual circumstances of the instituted acolyte, which usually only happens in the seminary, but uh, men are instituted acolytes on their way to becoming priesthood. And they are also, in that sense, ordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Um, but lay people certainly can be extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, and we desperately need them to do that so that they can bring communion to people who are sick and homebound. And uh, they can also um, uh, help with the distribution of communion at Holy Mass. I got a new question here. Um, it says, can you tell us about why you went to jail? And then it says, shout out to Mary Mother of the Church Yacht Club. Well, the viewers are really adding up here now. We got 11 viewers. I, I wish I could see who all the viewers were. There's no way to tell that, is there? All the people who are watching. I guess you have to submit a question if I'm going to know that you're viewing. You could even just say, I'm submitting a question. Um, can you, can you see me on your, okay, good. So shout out to Mary Mother of the Church at the Yacht Club. And the question is, oh, I'm gonna answer this one. Oh, hold on, I'm answering this one. The question is, oh, oh, someone just came in, great. Oh, this is from, uh, I, I don't know how to say that name. Jide? Jide, thank you. Someone knows you, Jide. <laughs> so um yeah i did go to jail i went to jail a few times in my life um maybe four or five times and uh, it was because i was arrested for blocking the entrance to abortion clinics so when i was in college uh i was a radical pro-lifer and uh, we we decided uh a, a few of us a couple times it was a few thousand of us we decided that we would stand in between the abortionist and uh, the victim of the abortionist which is the child and offer life-saving alternatives to their mothers in a movement that was called operation rescue and uh, it was very popular when i was in college in the 1980s and 90s it was changed it made much more difficult because president clinton passed a law called the freedom of access to clinic law and it made it a felony a federal offense to trespass at an abortion clinic oddly enough there's only two places it's a felony to trespass the military base and an abortion clinic but um the uh, so that meant minimum of six months in jail and that's a long time uh but i did uh a couple of weeks in jail myself so uh, i was arrested i was a repeat offender and eventually i got sentenced uh, the first time to a week in jail and it was actually a very blessed experience um, because uh, I knew I was in jail for the right reasons. I was in jail for uh, having stood in the gap uh, to prevent a child from being aborted. And uh, in fact, when we were arrested and when we were put in jail, we had the court trial. And right before we were sentenced, the judge said, is there anything you'd like to say for us to consider while you're being sentenced? And I said, um, uh, I said, well, yes, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, the day that we did this rescue, there was, in fact, a child who was saved. We know that because the woman couldn't get into the abortion clinic and she talked to the pro-life people who were there and they took her to a pregnancy counseling center and she decided to keep her baby. And, and you know, it takes a while to go to court. So this baby was already born by the time we were in court for that particular arrest. So I said to the judge, I said, if you really believe that what we did is wrong, then when that child's 18, you need to go to that child and say, you know, you shouldn't be here because those people were wrong to stand, to shut the abortion clinic down that day. And your mother was right to have, uh, you know, sought the abortion. Well, the judge didn't like that. And she slammed her gavel and she said, 10 days in jail. 
<laughs> and so, so then, sure enough, at that point, they actually take you to jail. So the sheriff comes out and he put handcuffs on me and he took me into the courthouse and you get to see parts of the courthouse that most people never get to see. And uh, we went down into the courthouse with all the other people who were going to jail that day for various reasons. And uh, we walked in, we were wearing suits when we were college students, you know. So we, we were dressed up because we wanted to look good. And somebody said, man, me and my friend, he's now a priest in Omaha, his name's Father Joe Taplin. And uh, we, he said, uh, uh, they said, hey, you guys must be drug dealers from L.A. <laughs> and we said, no, no, we're, uh, we're here for blocking the entrance to an abortion clinic. And they said, well, what did you do that for? We said, well, they were killing babies inside. What are we supposed to do? And the guy said, he's got a point. The guy's got a point. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, we ended up in jail. Uh, there was a, a lot of, of blessings being in jail. We were able to pray with some of the other prisoners. We were able to share our faith. Uh, we, I got to read Story of a Soul, the biography of St. Therese. First time I ever read it was when I was in jail. So there was a lot of blessings. And I pretty much figure that I'm going to be going back to jail because I'm a bishop now. <laughs> Within the next 25 years, uh, it's, it's going to be, things will be more difficult. At least that's what Cardinal George thought. So I'm pretty much prepared to go back. Um, let's see. Um, I got a question right here. What do you recommend to do to get ready for Christmas during Advent? This is from Sophie Johnson. Uh, what do I recommend to do during Christmas uh, to get ready for Christmas during Advent? Well, it's good to remember that Advent is kind of a penitential season. It's a season of preparation and waiting and longing. And so we're supposed to be reminding ourselves that we're living for heaven and that we're living for Jesus in our relationship with Jesus. So Advent's a great time to spend some more time in prayer. It's a great time to make some kind of penitential sacrifice, not the same degree as you would in Lent, but to give something up to remember the longing for the coming of the kingdom of heaven. It's a great time to take advantage of uh, some of our spiritual traditions, um, the Advent wreath, uh, Advent calendars, maybe some sort of daily meditation to help you get ready for Christmas. The church publishes all kinds of things that are out there that can help you to prepare. Uh, but most of all, a really important time to spend some extra quiet time in prayer. Uh, you might notice that Advent, the first couple of weeks, focuses on uh, the coming of Jesus at the end of time. And so really the, the orientation of Advent is to meditate on the fact that this is a temporary life we're living in and that we're headed for heaven. But then as the next two weeks, and especially the last eight days um, before Christmas happens, then we have um, a much more focus on the incarnation itself. And that's a great time just to meditate on uh, Mary's yes and what it cost her to say yes, and to meditate also on the reality of this fact that God uh, became one of us in order to show us his love. I think I had a question that was emailed in. Should I go to some of those? Didn't we have one emailed in today? Got it here somewhere. I had it. I had it earlier. This is one. Oh, so this was emailed in earlier. The Nicene Creed. Yeah, there's the one. The one. The Nicene Creed says, "I believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, but hasn't the Trinity always been there from the beginning of time, such as the Holy Spirit present at the time of Jesus' baptism?" Uh, the answer to that question is yes, in both accounts. So it's not actually a contradiction. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. But the point is, the Holy Spirit has eternally proceeded from the Father and the Son, just as the Father has eternally begotten of the Son, and the Holy Spirit has eternally proceeded uh, from them. So the Holy Spirit's always been there um, as, the, as the communion of love of the whole, Father and the Son. It's just that the Holy Spirit, in that procession, reaches us in time. Um, so the coming of the Holy Spirit is a time-bound event, 
but the Holy Spirit has always been uh, in the Trinity. Now, next question, yes. Two questions here. Um, this question is, uh, temptations um, are worldly possessions and things like power and prestige and sexuality. So what advice would you give to a, a consuming nation? So it is simply a fact that we live in this consuming nation. Um, just got a question that says that they're, they're getting live video broadcast will begin soon, but we're, it's working still, huh? Okay. So um, the, uh, the, what advice would you give for a consuming nation? Well, this has actually been a big thing that Pope Francis has talked about, um, and that is that we live in a culture of consuming, consumerism. They said the video is working now. We live in a culture of consumerism, and we apply that to just about everything. Um, and one of the things that happens in that is that we begin to uh, basically pursue things as use. Um, and so that's a very... Uh, it's obviously where we use things all the time, right? But it becomes really dangerous when we use people. And when we begin to pursue everything as a kind of end for myself. And this is where really when we come to understand what love is, love is a means of self-giving. And I will really only be satisfied and come to true happiness when I make a gift of myself. And so when I approach sexuality as a consumer, or when I approach possessions as a consumer, what I'm doing is I'm placing myself at the center of the universe and I'm seeking happiness by satisfying myself. My, my needs will never fully be satisfied. And so I'll only really find happiness by giving myself. And when I discover that it's by making a gift of my life. And so that's when love becomes an opportunity to give myself away. This is true love. And this is where you see that uh, the vocations have this incredible thing in common. Marriage is this man and a woman giving themselves to each other in, in love, but also a priest or a, a religious is a person giving away their life in love. And that's what leads to true happiness. Consumerism will only lead to more desire and more needs to be satisfied in the end. What was the other question? Oh, um, this is a question about prayer. Um, why waste hours praying when that valuable time in our life, our finite life, which is true, we have a finite life, it's good to remember, could be used towards helping and serving others in the community? For example, why should I go to church when I could do more at a good soup kitchen? Especially um, if, if we say all Catholics, you know, should pray. Why is that more important than helping our community? That's a very good question. And the answer is this, because we're going to spend heaven in a loving relationship with God. And that loving relationship with God is the most important thing in the world. Knowing who God is and that Loving relationship with God is the most important thing in the world. That's what heaven will be. And so prayer is when we begin to enter into that now. Even the Eucharist especially, it's a foretaste of heaven. And nothing gives more glory to God than prayer. Now, God desires that we would share that love with others. But if we just go out and serve without having prayed, without having received the love of God, and what we're sharing is not the love of God, but it can be something empty. It could be just do good or humanitarianism, which it is an evil in itself, but it's not necessarily helping the kingdom of God advance. Even look at the life of Jesus, for example. We could say to Jesus, you know, Jesus, what are you going to Jerusalem for to die on the cross when there's all these people who need to be fed? And you, you were feeding them and you were healing them. And now you're giving all that up to go die on the cross. Well, Jesus does that because he wants to save us and to offer his life as a gift for us. 
and to surrender his life to the Father on our behalf in order to save us. And really our own life of prayer, our celebration of the Eucharist is that self-surrender. And that's meant to feed us and then drive us out to share the love of God. But just to go out and do good deeds is not what Jesus was actually about. He was about saving people and saving souls. And that requires prayer because only God can save souls. You and I can't do it on our own. I've got some other listening questions that have come in. Um, so let's let's do one of these here that have come in. Um, this one came in. Um, and it said, uh, may, a, may, a, may a Catholic discern becoming a Protestant minister. Um, that's Jade as well. Is this Mary Mother of the Church Yacht Club? Yeah. Uh, the answer, that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is no. A, a Catholic may not discern becoming a Protestant minister because to become a Protestant minister would, of course, be to acknowledge that whatever Protestant church I would minister for is, in fact, the true church. And I would want to lead other people to that church. And a Catholic doesn't believe that. And so that would be to be untrue to my beliefs, um, just as we wouldn't allow a Protestant to become a Catholic minister if they didn't want to first become a Catholic. Yep. OK, here's another question. At a recent listening session for the new archbishop, many wanted to bring the church up to the times. One student stood up and said that Jesus was clearly a countercultural person. And he asked, should the church church still be countercultural? Absolutely. The church should still be countercultural. Jesus was countercultural. Um, the uh, in certain ways, in some ways he was full of, you know, a big part of the Jewish culture, but in certain ways he was very counterculture and the church should be countercultural. And the way that we clearly are countercultural today is we stand up for values that Jesus stood up for that are not welcome in our society. For example, Jesus was counterculture in that he was a celibate. And he proposed in Matthew chapter 19 that some people would be called to be celibates for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he used the word eunuchs. Most people think he used the word eunuch because that's the word that his contemporaries mocked him and his disciples with. They said, Jesus and his disciples, they're a bunch of eunuchs. And Jesus said, yeah, we are. We're eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, which means we've given up marriage in order to live for heaven, in order to advance the kingdom of heaven on this earth. That was clearly countercultural in the Jewish religion. And it's still countercultural today. And so those of us in the Catholic Church who have taken a vow of celibacy or a vow of chastity are completely counterculture. You want to know another way to be countercultural? Get married and don't get divorced. This is countercultural, right? Uh, or another way to be countercultural is if you're a person who's single, live chastity. This is completely countercultural. These are gospel values that are counterculture, and the church needs to do that. Okay, uh, more questions keep coming in. A lot of them are coming from this group at uh, Mary Mother of the Church. <laughs> um, so here's another good one. We'll try this one. Can a person who is severely mental disabled receive the Eucharist? Again, once more, shout out to the Yacht Club at Mary Mother of the Church. Um, can and the answer, can a person who's severely mentally able to receive the Eucharist? The answer is yes. They need the permission of the bishop, but it can be given. And uh, Pope Benedict actually wrote a beautiful letter on this called Sacramentum Caritatis. It was a letter on the Eucharist, sac the sacrament of charity. And in there, he addressed the issue of giving communion to uh, the mentally and physically handicapped, as well as the other sacraments. And he basically said the benefit of the doubt should always be given to the person receiving communion. So we want to, as best as able, for them to be able to understand what they're receiving. That is, they should be able to understand that this uh, host, which they're receiving, is not just ordinary bread. This is in some way Jesus coming to them. 
So we try to explain that to them in a way they can understand, but we give the benefit of the doubt. And if they have reached the age that people would normally receive communion, even if they're not mentally capable of being the same age, we would try to um, uh, offer them the sacrament. And it's a very interesting thing, actually, when you study the history of these things, like like I did once, that uh, you know, in the in the Eastern Church, they give communion to infants. Um, so they baptize them, give them confirmation and first communion, all in the same ceremony when they're you know a month old. In the West, we did that until about the year 1000. So it's it's only been a sense about the year 1000 that we moved first communion back to second or back to used to be about age 11 or 12 at the same time we gave confirmation but then in 1910 uh pope saint pius x wanted to give first communion to children younger as early as second grade seven or eight and so he moved first communion back but he left confirmation around 11 or 12 or now as we do it sometimes 13 14. so that's historically that was actually the first time that confirmation came after first communion it was always uh, the right, the proper order before before the 20th century. So um, anyway, the point of it all is to say that we should definitely give communion. And our own Marriage and Family Life Office has a program. Uh, we have an office for dis- people with disabilities, and we prepare them to receive the sacraments and to get Holy Communion. So we should definitely do that. Okay, uh, another question. Who is your favorite saint and why? Well. It's kind of hard to say because I have so many favorite saints. One of them is right behind me. This is St. John Paul II. Um, he's, he's one of my favorite saints. I, I, I met him when I was in the seminary. See, there's a picture of me and him. And that's also Father Becker right next to me. Can you see that? <laughs> he's the rector of the seminary. And that's, that's me. And that's, that's Pope John Paul II. And, uh, we, uh, and I just... He was an example of what God could do with a person who gave his life completely to God. And God used him in 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 ways that changed history. I mean, communism fell and young people all over the world came back to the church. And so he used him in the ways that changed history completely. My other uh, favorite saint is probably almost exactly the opposite. John Paul II traveled the whole world. My other one is St. Therese, and she lived in a cloistered Carmelite convent. She never traveled anywhere. But she wrote a beautiful book called Story of a Soul, which I mentioned earlier, which I read when I was in jail. And uh, it really uh, has helped me and transformed my life. And she's taught me a lot about trust and confidence. And I always kind of blame her for my becoming a bishop because the papal nuncio called me on October 1st, the Feast of St. Therese. So um, I figured it's her fault. Okay, we got some more questions here. Um, Let's see. Here's one. Um, do you have any fun stories about when you were in seminary? Um, well, I got to meet St. John Paul II once. <laughs> we were on our way to Jerusalem as a class, and we stopped in Rome, and we got to go to morning mass at Castel San, Ga- San Castel Gandolfo, where St. John Paul II uh was spending his August vacation. And so we got to be there in this very small chapel, about 20 people when he celebrated mass. And then he came out and he introduced himself to each of us and we got to shake his hand. And I said, I shook his hand and said, hello, Holy Father, my name is Drew, which is what people used to call me. And he said, huh? I said, Drew. He said, huh? And then I said, Andrew. He said, Andrew. And then, right then and there, I decided I would be Father Andrew, not Father Drew, um, because John Paul II knew that. So that was one funny story from when I was in seminary. Okay, another question. Um, here we go. Uh, this question is from Tammy Perrin. She's watching with her 16-year-old son. We have 19 viewers now. I wish I could see who they all were. What's that do? I don't want to touch that button. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> this says, uh, Tammy writes, we, my 16-year-old son Jacob and I, are sitting here and listening to all the great questions and answers. 
His question is, he's going to be confirmed in 2016, and he's wondering if his sponsor could be someone that is mentally handicapped. That's a good question. And the answer is no. Um, and the reason is because uh, although someone who's mentally handicapped can be a great friend and is certainly important to have mentally handicapped friends, I have a couple of them, um, and they can teach us so much about love. Really, a sponsor is, is someone that um, is, is going to be able to lead you deeper into the faith. And so um, it would be better for them to be a fully initiated Catholic who, um, who was able to enter into that kind of relationship with us as a mentor and leading us deeper into the faith, teaching us about the faith, holding us accountable to our faith. And most of the time, some mentally handicapped people could do that, but most of the time they wouldn't be the ones to do that. Uh, but as I said, it's really important to have them in our lives because they teach us so much about love. Okay, uh, we got another question here. Are there other questions I should have answered from coming on an email? Okay, here's the next one. What role has Mary had in your life? And do you think Marian devotion is important for our times? Absolutely. Uh, Mary has had a very profound role in my own life. and. Um, this is from Jose Hernandez, by the way, this question. Very profound role in my life, and I think Marian devotion is essential uh, for every time, but especially for our times, going back to, to the time of the apostles. Um, Jesus thought it was essential, too, which is why he gave his mother to his beloved disciple, John, um, because he wanted all of us, as the beloved disciple of Jesus, to take Mary into our hearts. Um, but Mary's been important to me. Um, when I was young, we prayed the rosary, and uh, it was really during the year that I was serving on the, a net team, the National Evangelization Teams, that I read the book by St. Louis de Montfort called True Devotion, and I decided to do the Marian consecration. But an interesting thing happened. So I was doing the 30-day consecration. I was saying prayers every day, and I was going to do the consecration on January 1st. But for some reason, and I still don't know why, and I still don't know if this was from God or from the devil, but what happened was about two days before I was going to do the Marian consecration, I just felt like I couldn't do it. I just thought, I, I was saying all the prayers, and I thought, it's just not right. I'm, maybe I'm not doing it for the right reasons. I didn't know what it was. I didn't ask anybody. I probably should have asked like a priest or something to say, should I do this or not? But anyway, I decided instead that I would make a New Year's resolution to pray the rosary every day. So that would have been January 1st. 1992 and I made that resolution and I think I could count on one hand the times that I failed to pray the rosary every day since January 1st 1992 so I did it every day that year and basically I've done it every day since um, I think once I was traveling all day and I and I forgot because I was up for more than 24 hours <laughs> but uh, but basically I've prayed the rosary every day since January 1st, 1992. And that really had a profound impact on me. And basically, I just began every year to grow deeper in my relationship with Mary. Eventually, I did do the 30-day consecration when I was a newly ordained priest and then uh, have renewed that consecration uh, frequently, but just have found that um, Mary, with her feminine heart, has a way of teaching me about love that I need. And she has a way of drawing close to me that helps me to have confidence and guides me. And so uh, for that reason, I chose as my motto when I became a bishop, uh, Prebe Nobis Cor Tuum, uh, which means lend us your heart. And it's a prayer to Mary. Mary, lend us your heart so that we can say yes to Jesus the way you say yes. And especially important for our times because. Um, our time, we live in a time where the dignity of women is not properly understood and respected. And Mary, uh, who was and is the most dignified woman, can help us to reverence and understand the beauty and the dignity and the gift that women have. And so we need a devotion to her today to understand that. Okay. There's a few more questions coming in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's from Suzanne Hayden. How should we, Suzanne, 
Glad to have you here, hanging out on Google. <laughs> How should we as Catholics view refugees from war-torn countries in the Middle East, and what can we do to help them? We should view them as people in need, not as terrorists. Now, of course, you know, we have to be smart and we have to um, have appropriate measures to discern whether or not a person is a terrorist, if we can. But we should remember that uh, we have a responsibility to help uh, refugees and that many of them are Christians who are fleeing for their lives because they've been kicked out of their homes uh, by uh, Islamic extremists. And so we need to provide a place for them if at all possible. So of course, the government has for years screened refugees and they need to continue to screen them and we need to develop good ways to screen them. I'm all in favor of that. But we must open our hearts uh, to these poor people who have lost their homes and many of them have lost their homes because they share our faith and they refused to get rid of their faith. They refuse to deny their faith. And so we need to um, do that. Okay, here's another one. Um, uh, oh, this is a question. How, here, we, here it comes. Jacob Horniker, how would you counsel an engaged couple who has been cohabitating? Uh, that's a great question. I, I had to do this a lot, actually. You know, when you're in the parish and you're doing marriage preparation, you, uh, people come and they've been cohabitating. And so, um, Usually I would start out this way. I would say, first meeting, and I, I usually, on purpose, I didn't even ask them if they were cohabiting because I didn't want to know at first. I just wanted to be able to say these facts. And I would say, so you sit before me, an average American couple coming to get married, and that means you got about a 50% chance of success. That's just the way it is in our society. You got 50% chance of making it if you're an average American. Now, if you want to increase your chances of getting divorced, so that you have a lower chance of success, there's some things you could do. The first thing you should do is you should move in together before you're married. Now remember, I don't even know if they're living together. I didn't want to know at this point. I'd say you should move in together before you're married because then you double your chances of getting divorced. So 75% of couples who get married, live, who live together before they're married and get married, get divorced. It's, the number's actually even higher though because Actually, only about 15% of living together couples who live together outside of marriage end up in lasting marriages. A lot of people separate before they ever get married. And of those who do get married, 75% of them divorce. So I would say, um, you know, you just double your chances of divorce. Now, but then I would say, okay, okay, let's suppose you want to do some things to increase your chances of success. Well, what you should do then is first thing you should do is commit to go to church together every Sunday. Because as soon as you go to church together, Sunday, you double your chance of success. 75% success rate in marriage for couples to go to church together. But let's suppose you're not satisfied with 75%. You want to go higher. I would say, well, then pray together every day. Because if you pray together every day, then you got a 95% success rate in marriage. But suppose you're not satisfied with 95%. You want to shoot for the moon. Then... You should live your marriage completely according to Catholic Church teaching as best as you're able starting right now. That is, live chastity until you're married. Once you're married, don't practice contraception, but practice natural family planning. Because then you're going to have basically a 99% chance of success. Couples who live their marriages completely according to Catholic Church teaching have a 99% success rate in marriage. So I usually just talk to them about the statistics and try to encourage them that way. And then, of course, later conversations have to be had with couples who are cohabitating about why it's so important to abstain as much as possible now as a way of sealing the marriage covenant. Because uh, it's a sad thing, actually, if my wedding night is no different than any other night because I'm not doing anything different on my wedding night than I've done any other night, um, because the wedding night's actually supposed to be the night where I'm sealing the marriage couple. Okay. Um, what? Oh, this is the last question. We're running out of time. This Google Hangout's about to hung up. <laughs> um, here we go. Let's see. Um, oh, this one's from some, this one's from Joe Huford. Joe, we didn't answer any questions from you yet, so here you go. 
I have had a few good Catholic friends fall away from the faith while in college. Besides praying for them, what's the best way to get them back and involved with the faith? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, it's a difficult question to ask because the mystery of someone coming to faith is different for every person. But uh, praying for them is really important because you know no one, no one of us can change another person's heart by our words or by our actions. Only the Holy Spirit can change a person's heart. So we have to pray for them, offer masses for them, pray for them. But the second thing I think we have to do is be a true friend. That is, show them respect and reverence by the way I care for them, but not uh, giving in to the negative things that our culture will say is fun or good to do, uh, but actually just trying to be a true friend to them, showing that I really care about them. And then in that way, gradually inviting them by sharing your own faith on a natural level and when you can inviting them to come to uh, events or things google hangout things like that uh, <laughs> so that uh, gradually they can begin to taste a little bit of the of what the faith is it's really the best kind of evangelism is what we call relational evangelism so i'm i'm being a friend of this person and in being a friend of them i'm going to share with them gradually about my faith and invite them to experience faith in a deeper way and see that it's real. But that only happens through relational evangelism. Okay, uh, I think that's it. So we're going to close with a prayer here. Maybe next time we can figure out how to do this so we can actually talk to each other. That would be more exciting than just reading the questions. But this has been, this has been great. Uh, I appreciate all of the 18 viewers and all those who came um, and uh, the Cathedral Young Adults group I can see is is logged on and St. Stephen's in Anoka um, is logged on and Mary Mother of the Church is logged on and some people from St. John Vianney Seminary. So it's great. And uh, let's close with a prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Mother Mary, we commend ourselves to you. We thank you for your love and care for us. Intercede for us and for all of the young adults in our archdiocese especially. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bye-bye.